Good evening and welcome back to a series called Truth and Reason. We are currently studying through 2 Peter and we'll be talking about 2 Peter chapter 2 and verses 1 through 3 in just a moment. We invite you to worship with us at the Northside Church of Christ in Russellville, Kentucky every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock and Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock and our building is located at 689 North Main Street in Russellville and if you're familiar with Russellville we're right next door to Kentucky Fried Chicken so come and be with us and let's study God's Word together. We are using these programs to bring us a little extra Bible study on Sunday evenings at 5 o'clock since we don't meet at that time. And uh, whenever you have a chance to listen to these programs, uh, we'd love to hear feedback from you. So email us, northsidechurchofchrist at hotmail.com. If you have any questions or comments about these lessons, please let us know as we study through the various epistles of, of the New Testament. And we're going to continue in our study of Peter's letters, getting into a section of Scripture which you could say is pretty much the, the body and the main thrust of, of uh, Second Peter, and that's dealing with false teaching. Uh, I find that sometimes, well, like with Jude, for instance, and in some of John's writings, uh, the shorter and more poignant letters that really get right to the point of false teaching, to me, kind of shows a, a desperate time that they're in. And they need, need to get these letters out, and they need to be read quickly, and they need to be dealt with quickly, because false teaching isn't something that you can just let lie. Uh, you can't let it um, you know, simmer and to build up to where eventually uh, it destroys the church. It destroys local congregations. It destroys the faith of of individuals. And we see this all through the New Testament epistles. Paul dealt with it, as I said, John and Jude dealt with it. And when you read in their, their letters, they often dedicate a pretty good section to the dangers of those teaching against the doctrines of Jesus Christ. And we have the same problems today. And that's why we're talking about these things, because, well, one, the apostles talked about them, and two, we're dealing with them. Because we live in pretty much the same kind of age dealing with the same false teachings that uh, they dealt with back then. Maybe not so much by topic, um, but even Satan knows how to kind of change his game plan, you might say. And even today, we have false teachers out there that are you know, still, quote-unquote, proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. But what are they saying about Christ in particular? Uh, are they denying Christ and uh, his, uh, his deity as, as you know, the Son of God uh, by the things that they say and do? Because I rarely hear people come out just outright saying, no, no, he's not the Lord. But yet I hear all types of variations in our religious world today that makes you think, well, who is Jesus exactly? You've got people in the mainstream talking about Jesus as just a prophet or a good man. People in the mainstream talking about Jesus as just a figurehead or just that we have the Lord within us and that religion and goodness and kindness is just something I find within me. And therefore they take away the, uh, the idea that Jesus is real and that God is real. And uh, I find many, many religions that lean upon what they call um, you know, theistic uh, evolution, meaning, well, they believe in God, uh, but, you know, everything in our world today that's accepted in science, accepted in our creation, uh, they want to put a little spin on it and think and teach like the world, but at the same time, uh, talk about God out of the other side of their mouths. But anyway, uh, there are all kinds of things we're dealing with today. Immorality, uh, you see what's going on in our society, in our world today. So it's not a pretty lesson. Uh, it's not a fun lesson. But it is a needed lesson so that we know what signs to look for. And though I'm only looking at about three verses tonight, as Peter, I think, in what we call chapter 3, divides his thoughts up between the variations of, of you know the work of false teachers, I think in these first three verses, we're kind of warned what to watch for. 
And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight, is the heresies to watch out for. And sometimes it's not only in the teachings that we hear, but the people uh, that are espousing these things. And we need to be very careful that we do not become followers of men who stray from the doctrines of Jesus Christ. So let's get into our passage this evening, and uh, let's begin with verse 1. Verse 1, it says, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. I kind of touched on that, you know, in the way that people use the Lord Jesus today uh, in their teachings, but we'll get back to that in just a moment. When we think about this term heresy that Paul mentioned, uh, excuse me, Peter mentions here in verse 1, just by definition, a heresy is a doctrine that opposes the teachings of the truth. Uh, it's a violation of doctrinal teaching, and, and not just what's accepted, but in this case, what the Bible has to say. And the ironic thing is, these false teachers are using the same Bible. Uh, they will still turn to the same passages, and much like in our lesson last week, as we left off with chapter 1, they, in essence, have kind of made the prophetic word uh, to their own liking. They've twisted it, turned it to mean something that it doesn't mean, and uh, they act as though God's given them their own private interpretation of God's word versus what the apostles revealed in Scripture. And uh, we can't use our society today, we can't use the fact that we are 2,000 years later to say, well, God's word must change and we must keep up with society's needs. And this is the cry of the world. And unfortunately, it's become the cry of many religions today to think they need to keep up with the times. And really, you know, man has not changed in his attitude and who he is. He's still in a lost state. We may have a lot of things available to us today, like technology and all, which we're using this evening. Uh, But the fact remains is we're pretty much the same people as we've always been. We have not evolved, as people like to say, as much as we think we have. We're still barbaristic in our... Is that the right word to use? Barbaristic? (laughs) We're still barbarians in our thinking we are still thinking like those that have not uh, you know, surrendered and humbled themselves to God. And Romans chapter 1 comes to mind every time. When I look out there in society today, I see exactly the pattern that Paul the Apostle speaks against uh, in that first chapter of Romans. But we'll refer back to that again in just a little bit as well. Because there's some things and signs that we need to watch out for. And so the number one thing that Peter mentions here is that this is going to come within, from within, uh, from among yourselves. Uh, Again, going back to something Paul said, it's hard to teach a lot of lessons from Peter without mentioning Paul because uh, they said so many of the same things. And Paul in his uh, Acts chapter 20, his address to the Ephesian elders, warned them that from among yourselves there will be those rise up like wolves in sheep's clothing. They will deceive the people. It's the same warning that Peter is giving here. And chances by this time, these things are already happening in in many churches. He sees this uh, destructive heresy uh, tearing apart local congregations. And and by the time Peter writes these things, he's, he's seen the establishment of these things. And now he's seen the downfall of some of these things as well. And so it didn't take long by the toward the end of the first century for people to uh, go against their faith. You know, I worship with a congregation that's, I guess, they've been around locally for about 50 years now. And we may think that's a long time, uh, but at the same time, that is a short time span. Where are we going to be in another 50 years? Will God allow us to exist as such? Will there be those come in after this generation that has stood for the truth and been strong in the truth? Will there be some kind of chink in the armor, you might say, where false teaching will come in and destroy. And I've seen it happen to churches. That's why desperately we teach and strive to teach the truth today so that the future generations won't fall by the wayside. And we have so much going on against us when you look at what the world and what it teaches. We need to stand firm in the faith. And so what you have here is people who secretly bring in destructive heresies. What does it mean by secretly? Well, The best way I can describe it is it's happening right under our noses and we don't even see it. It's so oftentimes the false teaching isn't from what we're hearing on the news. 
It's not from what we're hearing from some outside source. We can pretty much stand up against those things and see the difference between right and wrong. But when it comes from within, when it comes from a, a brother whom you trusted, a brother or sister whom you loved, and how sometimes their views might change over time, and they've become enamored with what society is teaching or another false religion, and then they start to bring that heresy into the church, slowly but surely. They start uh, with casual views, maybe a casual comment here or there. Maybe trying to change things because they become a little, I don't know, disoriented or maybe just not satisfied with what we've been teaching for 50 years. And so what you find is people start talking about the need for change. Well, we got to change something. we got to do something different. And usually that means we need to appeal to people. And what people start doing is they start appealing to people based upon uh, society's needs, physical needs, and pleasing people rather than teaching them the truth. Their behavior starts to change. These are signs to look for in heresies and heretics is that their behavior starts to change, and you find that they are slowly influencing others because, oh, they're starting to get a little bit more agitated with the work of the church. Uh, they're not dis they're, they're displeased, perhaps, with um, you know a certain, I'll just say, clique or a group that perhaps is teaching you know, and standing firm for a certain thing, and, and they separate themselves from that, and they separate themselves from their practices and the work that's going on in the church. And then what you find is that they will just pretty much outright oppose any teaching that's taught among a few at first. Um, they'll kind of call each other, share that information with each other. These are signs to watch for in heresies. Is It starts slowly and it starts influencing people one at a time. Rarely do you see someone just stand up one day in the middle of a congregation and espouse some false doctrine. <laughs> that rarely happens. It has happened, but it rarely happens in the, in the church. And that's why the devil has learned to be a little bit more slowly and methodically uh, get, getting into the minds of, of people. And then you find that they just out become very disagreeable people. They start accusing the church, its leaders, eldership, the, the preacher especially, uh, they start uh, accusing of things that are not necessarily so much taught or preached, but they start attacking from a very personal level as well, and they become argumentative in the many things that they say. Brethren, this isn't just something that, you know, this isn't something that we just assume will happen. I, in, in my life as a Christian, have seen these things. I've seen them since my youth. Uh, they've been things I've seen destroy congregations, and they've been things that I've seen congregations stand up against. And so d don't think that a congregation can't be strong and that they can't stand up against sin and, and the ways of Satan. It, it can be done. And so we're thankful for that. But we need to keep our eyes open. We need to see the signs that are out there because secretly bringing in destructive heresies that person may not come in or even become a Christian with the ideas of leading someone astray, but somewhere along the line, they got some weird thought in their mind, some weird teaching that came along the way. They became dissatisfied with the church in one form or another, and then they start leading people astray from within, from within. But we have to remember that sometimes that from among ourselves, it often starts because of something we heard outside of the church. Maybe something somebody said to us or did to us. Maybe it's something that, I don't know, somebody hurt me. So you find some reason to uh, you know, stand against them. And oftentimes you bring doctrine into the issue. Where the next thing you know, you've got a line drawn in the sand. And you don't know which side you're on. But what happens then in verse 2 is the most disheartening point of all this. And it says, and many will follow their destructive ways. I'll stop there because the end of verse 1, we have to remember they will bring on themselves swift destruction. Now, how will that come? Well, one, we could think about the day of judgment. I mean, obviously, you know, God would not allow such things uh, to go unpunished. So we know that at the end, uh, they won't have a home in heaven with God. That's the saddest part of this. Uh, but two, also, you know, Paul teaches us how we need to deal 
with those that have led people from the faith. He talks to the Thessalonians about it. He talks to the Corinthians about it in chapter uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and how we need to deliver such a one to Satan for destruction. And of course, that's about correcting and disciplining and withdrawing from someone if need be to bring them back. Uh, at some point once they've corrected their ways, which the church in Corinth seemed to have done by the time you get to the letter uh, 2 Corinthians. And we've studied those things before in other lessons. Uh, but getting back to what Peter says here, many will follow their destructive ways. It'll lead to their destruction as well. And then it says, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. And that's the one accusation Nobody ever wants to be guilty of. That's the one accusation no one ever wants to be accused of is, is blasphemy. But that's what it is. When you stand against God's word and you stand against his truth, uh, it's blasphemy. And it will destroy souls. And remember, it's not only the fact that an individual may be speaking false teaching, but it's the fact that others will hear. Others will be influenced, as I pointed out a few moments ago in looking at secretly bringing in those destructive heresies. There's a slow burn, a slow influence there that sometimes you may not see for months, maybe years, until it's too late. And so that kind of deceptiveness will destroy people's souls. And what we find is that many will be uh, following, uh, convincing themselves that Oh, this churchman's teaching it wrong all these years. Or something happens. Maybe something happens among one of the members. Uh, maybe get, they get themselves into a bad situation, and people don't want to don't they don't want to condemn it, so they start siding with the sin that has taken place. That's happened a lot of times in churches as well. And so we've got to stand firm when it comes to the truth, which means sometimes we may lose friends in the process. It may mean that we have to rebuke and correct a wrong. It may mean that we have to share some unpleasant words uh, with folks that are out there. Because leading people astray, that's their goal, to create division. There's some passages that we also need to uh, look at in comparison to what Peter is saying here. Let's go over to Romans chapter 16 uh, for just a moment. Romans chapter 16 and looking at verse uh, 17. It says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. All right. I want to talk about verse 18, but we're going to save that for just a moment here, okay? He says, I urge you. He's talking about the urgency of this matter to, you know, shine a light on this thing. The Bible teaches us that we are to expose sin with the light. Uh, next Wednesday and into next Sunday, we'll be talking about the Sermon on the Mount, especially the Beatitudes. And, and uh, at the end of that passage, in the next few verses, you find that we are to be the light of the world. And one of the responsibilities of light is to shine light that we may not be in a dark place. We shine light on sin to expose it for what it is, Ephesians chapter 5. And we are to rebuke said sin. And so here in Romans chapter 16 and verse 17, he says, note those who cause divisions and offenses because these are contrary to the doctrine of Christ. And if something's contrary to the doctrine which you've learned, he says, avoid them. Don't let them be part of your life. Avoid them. That's a direct command uh, by apostolic command right here. Well, they create division. That's one of the things they do. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, a verse we've studied many times, he says, Let there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Over and over again, the Bible does not teach to agree to disagree. It does not teach that we can be divided and still acceptable in the sight of God. We've got to get on the same page. It may mean we have to study through a matter. It's not my opinion versus your opinion. It is what does God's word have to say. And then we can join together in true fellowship and communion with God's word and Christ himself. Because 1 Corinthians 1 and 10 uh, begins actually with verse 9 that says our fellowship is in Christ. And if our fellowship is truly in Christ, then we're going to preach the same thing and teach the same thing as verse 10 says. Well, another problem that we run into then is the way 
that uh, the heretics will approach us. And verse 3 uh, once again gives us more insight as to their methods and things that we need to watch out for. And it says in verse 3, By covetousness, by covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. Well, let's go back to Romans 16 that we mentioned just a few moments ago, because right there in verse 18, let's talk about some of this, this covetous way in which a heretic will try to exploit us. It says in verse 18, For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Well, there it is. None of us want to believe that our hearts can be so simple. But if we have not armed ourselves with the truth of the gospel, uh, we're bound to believe anything. And we have to be very careful. Because if we don't, you know, as the old song says, if we don't stand for something, we're bound to fall for anything. And that's the same thing with God's truth. If we don't stand for God's truth, we'll believe anything. The smooth words, the flattering speech. I'll admit, sometimes I've got to get up in the pulpit and, and pound the pulpit, as we say. Maybe not so much literally, but my words are strong. As a preacher, I have to get up and point out sin. And sometimes I show anger at sin. Sometimes I don't come across as the nicest guy. But I tell you what, Satan can get up there and please everybody. He can smile. He can make you feel good. He can make you feel a million bucks all while you are so steeped and lost in sin. All because... He's telling you, everything's okay. Be very careful of the covetousness of man because that's how Satan plays upon deception. He plays upon our understanding and he tells us something's right when it's not. Hey, he did it with Eve. Go back and read. Go back and read Genesis. Go back and read how he changes one little word when God said, do not eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Or you will surely die. And Satan said what? Eh, you'll not surely die. And I'm sure he said it real nice like. And I'm sure he pleased the ears of Eve. And she saw that fruit. And it was good to eat. So what did she do? She ate it. This is the thinking of our world today. Well, God made it. It's good. I'll partake of it. They do it with drugs. They do it with sexual pleasures any other kind of sin that's out there, ultimately, they like to go back and blame God, just like Satan does. And we have to be very careful with that kind of thinking. Well, as we come to the close of the lesson, let's just remember these few points here, that these deceptive words, this smooth and flattering speech, is about pleasing men. It's not about pleasing God. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10, Paul the Apostle says, Do I now seek to persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? If I still pleased men, I would not. Let me emphasize that. If I pleased men, I would not be a servant of God. So who are we going to serve? That's the question that we have to ask ourselves. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 3, we're warned in that passage that the time would come. Men will have itching ears and they will heap up for themselves false teachers. And why? Because they will no longer endure sound doctrine. They want to hear things that, that tickle their fancy, as we like to say. And these are the things that will destroy their souls. Yet we have it in abundance in our world today. Not a whole lot's changed in 1900 years, has it? And then, of course, the last point to be made from this passage is they're not going to stop until they get you. They're not idle. They're hard workers. And they show that they're hard workers. And they will not rest. They want you to change your mind. They want you to accept their way of thinking. They want you to tolerate their sin and their false teaching. And they will not rest until they do. You know, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 32, after Paul the Apostle gives us a pretty lengthy list about the sins of the world, he warns those that accept that way. He says not only do they practice them, but they accept they allow, they tolerate the sins of the world, and the next thing you know, they're destroyed as well because they are held in guilt 
well, like we like to say, by association, you might say. We need to stand up to sin. We need to stand against sin. And we need to stand for Jesus Christ, our Lord. And it's not just a matter of going out on the street corners and preaching how bad everyone is. But it's also about going out and showing the goodness of God. The great life that people can have. There is a positive approach that we can take toward this argument. But when something comes along that's overtly wrong, when something comes along and has crept its way, even in and among brethren, it needs to be cut out. It needs to be stopped. It needs to be addressed, rebuked. We have a whole responsibility toward that as well. And Paul, excuse me, Peter, has a lot more to say about this subject in our future lessons. So we'll stop there at this time and just let this be a warning, an admonishment, and something to encourage us through the week to, yeah, watch out for false teaching. But how do we do that best? We arm ourselves with the sword of the Spirit. That is the Word of God. We take this Word. We use it in our lives. We learn it because, as Jose said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Really, that's God saying that. And we, need, we want to be His people, right? then we need to hang on to his words and his revelation that he gave us through his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross that we may have remission of our sins. Well, thank you for joining us in our study of truth and reason. Because it is truth, it is reasonable. And what the world is offering is not, because the end result is destruction. So arm yourself with knowledge and things to watch for in the false teacher, in the heretic, and for the heresies that will destroy not only them, but ourselves as well. Let's stand for the truth. Let's stand for God's righteousness. And may God bless you in your search for truth and reason.